Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel uh, at the Beck Conference on Statewide Sustainability Programs Supporting Change in Over 2000 Communities. Oops. Um, I'm Lola Schoenrich and I work at the Great Plains Institute and manage the Sustainable States Network. And all our panelists today are uh, members, work for programs, state programs that are members of the Sustainable States Network. I, I have to do a brief commercial for the Great Plains Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit, national nonprofit organization working on climate and energy issues. And I um, and the vice, am the vice president leading our community level work where we work directly with local governments, cities, counties, uh, and institutions within them to on energy and climate issues. The Sustainable States Network, which I manage as, as part of my work at Great Plains Institute, is a network of 15 state level programs, statewide programs that support local governments in addressing sustainability and climate. And our collective vision is to make sustainability the norm, which means we get it put on the local government to-do list and provide the support that's needed to get the work done. The network itself, uh, purpose is to connect and align the various statewide sustainability programs, enable members to share resources and best practices, and foster the success of multi-state um, projects. There's, as you see, 14 states that are members, 15 programs, they have two in New York. And uh, this year we've added a couple of new programs, Indiana and Georgia, and we're also helping programs get started in Iowa and Nebraska. Um, sorry, I'm fussing around here. And um, the purpose of our panel today is to introduce you to this model of the statewide sustainability programs that address, address and support local governments in addressing climate and clean energy and improving equity for their residents. It, it's, it's commonly thought that local governments have an essential role in solving the climate problem, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, units of local government. You can cruise around on Google and find numbers ranging from 14,000 to 20,000 in the United States. Um, and so getting large numbers of them to take effective action on climate, it, it, it's, it seems like a daunting task. And we want to share and talk with you about how we are able to successfully work with large numbers of communities and really move them to action. Um, we have 45 minutes today. We have three speakers in addition to myself. And so we'll give you a taste of how the statewide sustainability programs on our panel succeed by using behavior change principles and we'll invite you to stay on for breakout group conversations after the um, panel. Uh, Elisa, we have a poll that we're gonna ask you. And our, our question is, we often think of behavior change in individual terms. So how do you get an individual to do something differently? <clears throat> but can an entire city be encouraged to address climate through behavior change?
we're getting close. So let's um, go ahead and end the poll. And Elisa, there we go. Let's share the results. Did I manage to do that? Share the results? Yes, they're being shared. Okay, perfect. Can, do you want me to read them off if you can't see them, Lola? Yeah, that'd not? be great. Sure, so we have plenty of yeses, 15 out of 18 yeses with 83%. One no, and um, two, it would be um, it sure it could help, but it can't be done at the scale needed. So with that, okay. With that, about, moving yeah. right along. The, the state sustainability programs, statewide sustainability programs on our panel all have more or less the same elements and operate more or less the same way. So instead of everybody telling you the same thing over and over again, I'm gonna describe those briefly, those shared elements and let the individual panelists fill in the details. So we have success by recognizing that municipalities are actually run by an interconnected web of individuals. There's staff, there's local elected officials, there are many cities and towns and villages have volunteers that are uh, involved on boards or commissions, and then community-based organizations, uh, neighborhood groups. And we've designed programs that aim to overcome those individuals' perceived barriers and to maximize their own perceived benefits. So all of the programs are grounded in behavior change principles. And they have these following elements that you're kind of looking at here. Um, we're aiming to change the behavior of the individuals with the goal of having real change in local policies, local programs, both in municipal operations and in community, things that influence the whole community. Uh, the programs tend to involve staff, work a lot with city staff, volunteer commissions, uh, green teams, and so on. The barriers that those people tend to have are lack of information, time, resources, particularly in smaller communities, that is to say not the core center city in a major metropolitan area, uh, they may have many responsibilities and lots to do. And, uh, and, and people in local governments, like in many jobs, they, they tend to have a personal disinclination to take the risk of doing something that you haven't ever done before. And there's a risk in going first. So if you're assigned to put a solar panel on the city parking garage, and you don't know anything about that, it might not be at the top of your to-do list. Um, so a key element in, in all these programs is providing a framework of sustainability with a vetted list of actions that have yielded benefits in a city like yours. So a smaller community, a suburban community, a rural community, it's gonna look at what New York City has done or San Francisco, and they're gonna say, that's not us. So these programs have often many best practices that communities can choose from. People who have, are being asked to do something they haven't done before and don't have time for, uh, they need somebody to walk alongside them, providing data, training, guides that are already pre-vetted. It's helpful to, if you can give the staff people extra help with interns, fellows, AmeriCorps volunteers, and connections to the state agencies, the utilities, the universities, the local nonprofit that can help. Um, these, all of these types of institutions are, tend to be a black box from the outside, of course. And so making the, the peer, the individual connections is really important. 
peer connections are super important uh, for at least a couple of reasons. And, and one is that the most common source of information for let's say the public works guy is likely to be the guy who has the same job in the town next door. Uh, and, and so there's a sort of a growing body of expertise and knowledge by connecting people to one another, to their peers. Uh, another reason is that people tend to like to be seen as leaders, but they don't actually like to be the person who goes first, especially if there's a risk in going first. So there's safety in numbers and people can come along in a group. Recognition is important. Uh, I, I live and work in, Minnesota, in Minneapolis and Minnesota and people in the Midwest maybe particularly will tend to say recognition isn't important to them, but that actually isn't true. Um, it does matter and it, it builds social currency and individual you know, accolades um, and recognition from peers and trusted entities like municipal leagues is super important. So, and, and then another, Thing we've tried to do, all of our programs have aimed for and achieved tipping points in the number of communities that are engaged in our programs. And that's part of this goal of putting sustainability and climate squarely on the local government to-do list. And as you know, if you work with local governments, there's a, um, a healthy debate about what the role of local governments is and you know some pick up trash and some don't and um, so putting climate or sustainability on the to-do list is is a new idea for many programs I want to introduce our panel um, three of them Jim Price is the, or let's see, let's start at the, at the left here of the picture. Kristen Rose leads the Minnesota Green Step Cities program and works at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, which runs the program. Jim Price is the senior program manager, senior program manager for Sustainable Pittsburgh which works with municipalities to help them measure and enhance their performance with policies and practices of sustainability. And he man manages Sustainable Pennsylvania, a statewide recognition program. And Randy Solomon is the executive director of Sustainable Jersey, a similar program in New Jersey. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen. Thank you, Lola. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just start with a little bit of background and introduction to the Minnesota Green Step Cities and Tribal Nations programs. Um, they're kind of sisters, sister programs with each other. So um, we are a challenge assistance and recognition program just like many of the other state programs that you'll see in uh, the sustainable states network and we're really um, you know designed for small and medium-sized communities uh, across minnesota in fact 34 percent of our um, green step communities are smaller than 5,000 in population Communities, um, cities and tribal nations choose from a menu of, we have over 180 uh, best practice actions, um, as well as around 75 metrics under our five main categories of buildings and lighting, land use, transportation, environmental management, and resilient economic and community development that all really feed into that sustainable um, and community sustainability model. Currently, we have 140 cities participating in the program um, and four tribal nations. Um, Minnesota has a lot of cities, 
for a state. We have 854 um, and about 16% of our cities participate. Um, and those communities together cover um, and include around 52% of the state's population. So um, small and medium sized cities um, and communities really do make an impact uh, across the state. We'll go to the next slide, Lola. So I, I looked at the stages of change um, for the sake of this conference and tried to think about how Green Stuff fits into that model. And so you'll kind of see those stages um, of pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, et cetera, there in the colors. And um, really where we come in as a program uh, is under that third stage of preparation. Um, and that is our step one. So we have five steps in the program for uh, our communities to try to um, ramp up with. And step one um, is, is for a city or a tribal nation to sign a resolution. So they're making some kind of public commitment to working on sustainability um, actions and metrics uh, with the program and assigning a coordinator and thinking about how they're going to start doing that. And so they're kind of preparing for, you know, those conversations and the actions um, that they're going to be working towards. Our uh, steps two and three revolve around taking action um, and reporting those actions, which are a big um, important piece of the program is, is that um, reporting piece of it and really sharing sharing the story. And, and then steps four and five, our five being our highest, um, are in that maintenance area. There are, like I mentioned, um, a number of metrics that communities can look at to start tracking um, and thinking about how their actions are making a difference and an impact in their communities and also help prioritize where they might want to be taking some additional action um, in certain areas. And of course, our goal for you know any program like this is, is to really see that behavior change um, and have that sustainability aspect really ingrained in the way that the, the um, city or the tribal nation uh, government staff and decision makers, council members operate day to day. Uh, that sustainability is included in their development process, in their uh, ordinances, in their planning, uh, and everything just becomes intuitive. Uh, next step, please, Lola. And so thinking through what are the key behavior change aspects of the program, um, we launched the program back in 2010, and behavior change was was built into the program design at the time, uh, and in those early discussions. And so, some of those key elements that we, you know, still use today are uh, perhaps maybe inadvertently a friendly competition. Um, this is a program that's made for cities to document themselves over time and their individual efforts, but because they're documenting that, documenting that publicly, other communities start to see and pick up on, on what they're doing, what they're leading on, and, and they want to lead to. Um, but, and so through that transparency and the public disclosure of the actions and metrics that, that um, our communities are reporting, they start to outcompete and, and want to lead their peers. And then residents and businesses in the community are also able to track what the city is doing or not doing, um, which allows for you know, that public comment and increased demand of um, actions. And another key element of the program is providing high profile recognition at the annual League of Minnesota Cities Conference, um, where peer communities from across the state gather and see the award blocks displayed um, and hand it out on stage in front of all the attendees. And then city elected officials and staff get a, you know, a Green Step City sticker on their badge and uh, photos get shared on social media and through press releases. And so it really helps to build um, that sense of status uh, for program participants and interest from those who aren't currently participating. 
And then one aspect that we use as a selling point, um, I would say, is the overall convenience that the program provides and by creating a one-stop shop for sustainability and climate best practices and resources and support. Um, as we all know from recycling, the recycling industry, if it isn't convenient, you will only capture the attention of you know, the truly committed people. Um, and so by creating something that's convenient, overall initial participation is, is more likely to occur. And then using continuous prompting through emails, newsletters, social media, surveys, phone calls, site visits, um, all of those things, uh, you know, we like to call ourselves sometimes like, we're like a personal trainer um, where we can help encourage the, that ongoing participation and, and help really achieve those outcomes. And then finally, by sharing proven outcomes that communities have realized we can, you know, further build the interest and build momentum in the program from um, currently participating and in, in interested in um, communities who are who want to participate. And so I know you can't see that graph on the right there. But the point is that we continue to see interest grow in the program over time. Um, so something something is working right. Um, and with that, I will um, I will finish my slide. And I think we get to move on to Jim. Great, thanks, Kristen. Um, yeah, so I'm with um, sustainable. I'm with sustainable Pennsylvania. Well, I'm actually I work for Sustainable Pittsburgh. I'm a program manager for Sustainable Pittsburgh, and our footprint is the southwest corner of the state. But this program is a statewide program, Sustainable Pennsylvania. It's a community certification program that we manage collaboratively with the Pennsylvania Municipal League, essentially our league of cities for Pennsylvania. We have been and active since 2012 and we have more than 120 municipalities now or 120 municipalities certified in the program it's slightly different than the other two you'll hear from today in that it's an assessment program as opposed to a uh, select an action program we actually ask that folks who go through the program ask answer every question in the program whether they've done it or not and provide verification of that program. So it's slightly different in that respect, but in most other respects, it's very similar. And I'd say that we approach behavior change really by looking at every way that we can encourage behavior to change. People have many different, people will come with many different interests. And so we try to recognize that when you're dealing with a municipality or dealing with leaders, they're gonna come at this with different interests. And so we try to, um, look at each one of those and see how we can affect change. So and much like uh, Kristen was just talking, we, we make a big point of recognizing folks. We know that people like to be recognized for the work that they're doing, but it's also a great way to put a face uh, in leadership out there for folks to see. So we present awards to folks. We do press releases when you've successfully completed a program. We have a map on our, uh, on our um, page now, that's actually a new thing on our new program. We have been very actively going through a, a large upgrade to our program, which um, will be released on December 8th. And I'm gonna talk about a few of those things that have been added to the program that have been largely in, the, in, in the, quite a number learned from the other programs in this network. We are a little bit smaller, but growing than some of the other organizations that you're gonna hear from today or um, from the other organizations you're gonna hear from today. Um, so I mentioned, so the recognition piece really is to get those folks that are very interested in not only making their community look good, but they want to look good as them, themselves and they want those bragging rights with their part with their uh, local communities. So that's a tool that we use. And then for the folks that are really invested and they've already decided that they want to do something, they know it's important to them. That's where we try to bring in the tools that can help them. So I mentioned that the program itself is an assessment. It really gives you an overall view of where you're at as a municipality, where, what aspects of the community you can look at and what you've done. So we get to see what things a municipality has done and what they haven't done. And we can assess that and decide where we're gonna go moving forward based on that information. So we can customize the work and make sure that we're not missing people in the process. They're, they have the ability to produce reports so our new system actually has a, a customizable feature where they can pull reports on their own. So they can look at what actions they plan to do in the future. They can look at it based on impact tags or co-benefit tags. And I'll talk about that in a second. 
Um, there is a ton of resources being developed for the program. We have quite a bit already built, but we're increasing that and that could be best practices that we're gonna share with them or technical support that they can get from other programs in the state, uh, funding opportunities, things like that. And um, one of the other key ways that we're able to support them is our uh, Department of Community and Economic Development has formally recognized our program on their grant application process. So if you're just going through a grant application process, it's another way for them to see that there's this opportunity to become a sustainable Pennsylvania community. And that really helps get our message out there. We encourage people to get involved in our network of folks. We have, we're adding two new pieces to this the program, which is a mentorship. Uh, we, they will get points for being mentors um, with other communities. So we think that's a great way to support them. Sustainability team is def definitely um, something that municipalities tend to uh, work on their own and we wanna make sure that they're including the community in that work. And when they do that, they definitely enrich their um, work quite a bit. And that is certainly something that we've copied from some of the other uh, um, programs that exist today. I'm sure that Randy will talk quite a bit about, about the work that they do around their, um, their green teams. And then we also have a chat feature on the new system. So municipalities can actually chat with each other on the new system um, and discuss any issues that they might have and work together to solve them and encourage uh, their, co their other municipal folks that are available. And then transparency is a big part of it as well. We have, we, we have profiles on our website that will share information about what municipalities have done we use web verifications for quite a few of the actions. So if they have claimed to do to, to have done a certain action, we want them to put that on their website. Not only does it um, uh, share with us that they've done that thing, but it's also sharing with the public that they've done that thing. And we have um, had quite a number of municipalities actually redesign their website after going through the program because they saw it as such a huge benefit for them. Um, and then we use impact tags to talk about co-benefits of the actions that are in there. There's more than 130 actions in the current program. The updated program has about 160. And um, so there's quite a few questions that we ask people to go through. And then we also survey them at the end of the process. Have they learned anything? Did, was there something that they wouldn't have done that they otherwise would have done? And, and we're actually doing that on every section moving forward. So we can really get an idea of what was done as a direct result of going through this process. And another thing that we've done that is unique, um, that is um, like that is that we've um, made it so questions um, expire at different times. So if you go through, and the, the entire program lasts for three years and we have it set up, I mean the entire, you, your, once you've certified, your, ex, your certification lasts for three years, but we didn't want you to have to come back every three years and answer the same question. So we have expiration dates on the actual questions so that the next time you come back, we're not asking you the same questions. We're asking you all the additional questions. Okay, we know that you've done these things in the past. So what else are you going to do moving forward to earn points? The only questions that we ask over and over again are things that we want to make sure that you are communicating on a regular basis with the public. Like, have you put information about sustainability in your newsletter and, and information about how you, uh, you save energy and whatnot? Because municipalities have quite a bit of power because there's so many touch points that a person, a resident, or a business owner in a municipality has with the community. So Lila, if you want to move to the next slide, um, just share a couple real quick slides. This is, um, the, this is the map of uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, we were talking about, Lola was talking about how many municipalities. Well, there are 2,500 municipalities, 2,561 municipalities in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but unlike a lot of other states, there, are no, there is no unincorporated land. So a lot of those municipalities are very small. There are only three municipalities in the entire state that have more than 100,000 people, Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia, and Allentown. And beyond that, there are, and there's only 150 that have more than 15,000. So there are quite a few small municipalities. And that's really our goal is to get most of what we consider the full service municipalities, those that have planning departments or have a planner or do their own zoning and, and, and um, and permitting processes in, in, in themselves. So those are, those, are the those are the municipalities that really have a lot of power to affect change. Um, the, the 120 municipalities that are certified represent more than 3.4 million re residents. 
Um, we have 30 more that are pledged and they've collectively done more than 9,000 actions um, across the state specifically as a relation to this. And that was without having to get recertified, which is now part of the process. And then if you wanna to switch to the last slide there, Lola, just wanna talk very briefly. We've also, these are the impact tags. Um, these are not the topics. The topics are related to the departments of the municipality. So they might be uh, planning, they might be waste and, and uh, um, removal, they might be municipal operations, but these are the impacts that we're really looking for. And they can, they're able to pull a report based on these impacts once they've finished their work. So they can see where they might be able to improve in any one of these given areas. And our large focus is really on those first three, the carbon reduction, social equity, and climate resilience currently. That's our big focus and all the others are bonuses. Um, but if, um, and we also, the last two, two measurable, measurable improvements, these are gonna be the questions on the program that are related specifically that are, um, as Kristen was talking about, that are measure, that show measurable impact. Things like water, water savings, energy savings, uh, equity analysis of boards and, and hiring processes, things like that. Things that you can actually show a quantifiable impact on. So we'll be tracking that as well and be able to pull reports on that uh, moving forward. But with that, I will hand it over to Randy. Hi everybody, my name is Randy Solomon. I'm the Executive Director of Sustainable Jersey. We are maybe the oldest, but one of the oldest and, and probably the largest of all these um, state programs. Like everyone else, we have a certification program for municipalities, which is kind of the visible tip of the iceberg of a larger program that's trying to support and motivate and pull strings and pull levers to move uh, New Jersey's 566 municipalities forward. 566, by the way, which is a number that I thought was crazy for a state the size of New Jersey until I met Jim and he told me about the 2,500 municipalities they have in Pennsylvania. Um, so I think they won the prize for multiple municipal madness, but they have a tremendous amount of authority. So the question is, how do you move them forward? Um, so Sustainable Jersey tries to create a, a broad framework for action. Um, we coordinate at the highest level, we coordinate priorities among different actors, um, priorities and resources and policy among state foundations, um, state agencies, in some cases, the private sector, um, also working directly with lo the local governments themselves to identify the specific things that we think they could and should do to help them achieve their local goals, but also to collectively impact statewide and global goals. We develop tools and resources and guidance to help them make progress. We provide access to grants um, and other forms of technical assistance, and we recognize their accomplishments, which is a big part of it. And I really wanna note that a lot of what we do can really only be done in the state context because um, a lot of the resources we provide, a lot of the technical assistance we provide, a lot of the political rewards that we provide to motivate them and turn good policy into good politics only really matters at the statewide level and couldn't be done by kind of a national group. Uh, next slide. So the, the one big part of the credibility uh, of our program and the success of our program is that the standards that we create, the specific actions that we want them to take, uh, which are the ordinances, the policies, the plans, the programs, um, we create these actions and these standards through a bottom-up, top-down process where we have about 20 different issue-based task forces, sort of climate and energy, land use and transportation, waste and recycling, water, et cetera. Um, and we bring together all the, the relevant players and come to consensus about what, um, what the municipalities really sh could be doing, should be doing, and what kind of resources they need to make progress and that is what goes into our program. Those are the specific things that municipalities can do to get certified um, and it's a point system. So they implement an action, they prove that they've done it, it's a rigorous process uh, and they can get points, to get enough points to get certified. Um, and a big, uh, well, next slide. Uh, and I'll, um, so the, the net result has, is that it's been very successful. So, um, 81% of all New Jersey municipalities are participating. Uh, there's over 200 of them that are certified. 
um, at the, we have different tiers of certification. There's also a schools program, which has taken off uh, due to the success of the municipal program. So Sustainable Jersey has become fairly ubiquitous in New Jersey among local governments as kind of the driver and guiding force for local actions to become more sustainable. Next slide. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of the scale of it, um, we, we have 90 events and trainings uh, every year. Well, this past year we did. Some years we have more. Um, this past year, which was a down year because of COVID, uh, they submitted the municipalities over 3,003, well, not over, exactly 3,340 um, actions, specific instances where they were trying to prove that they did something from our checklist. Um, and of those, 1,900 were approved as meeting our standard. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty wide breadth um, and depth of activity that's happening across the state. Um, almost 6,000 requests for assistance and a lot of web traffic. So it's a, a pretty big operation generating a lot of activity across the state. Next slide. Um, and just at a glance, um, a big part of what you know, we talk about behavior change, a big part of what motivates local politicians and green team members and local committee members is recognition. Um, and we, and our sort of media outreach and coverage is part of how we recognize them. We don't skimp on that. That's a big kind of robust operation. Next slide. Um, and we, we recognize that they need help to do what they're doing. And so we're not just kind of sitting around expecting that, you know, we're going to get blood from a stone. Um, we provide grants that we fundraise from both public and private sources. Next slide. Uh, and we also provide in-depth technical assistance on a number of different issue areas. And the, the technical assistance, um, this, what I'm showing here is just kind of a, a tip of the iceberg. And this is what we provide directly. Um, uh, and, and we note who some of those funders are, but there's 10 times as much that's being provided by partner organizations who participate in those task forces have um, bought into the specific action that's in our program, uh, you know, related to the, their topic of interest um, and are offering their own technical support to local governments uh, to help them implement and make progress. Next slide. So in terms of behavior change, you know, our, overall our, our program is really trying to think about the leverage points to get municipalities to move forward and implement something. Um, and we, we, you know, although we, we don't talk about behavior change when we're thinking about our strategies, it very much relates to behavior change. And what are the key things that we need to do to get them to change? So one thing we need to do is we need to make it safe for them, safe for public officials who want to get reelected, safe for um, business administrators and other staff who don't want to get in trouble. Um, and so the, um, through our task force process, through our research, and now after 10 years through our reputation, we have been able to make it politically safe um, so when there's a, an action in our program, you know, do this with solar panels, do this with EV charging, do whatever it may be, um, they, they know that there's consensus behind this and that's something that they can, they're not going to be far out on a whim if they do it. They know it's going to be technically safe. So they know that we're going to give them a very detailed, very prescriptive um, best practice of what to do. And it's not, it's not, it's not very, it's not generalized. It's not like, oh, do something with green building and here's a link to the US Green Building Council, you know, have at it. We will give them the specific ordinance we want them to pass related to green building that we know is vetted in New Jersey by the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs and by the New Jersey American Planning Association and, you know, whatever it may be. So it's, it's gonna be um, technically ripe, complete, vetted and safe. Um, and then we make good policy into good politics. Um, we provide, and I won't go into details, but in terms of um, our presence at the kind of statewide political events and conferences and um, press that we provide and other things that we do, we, you know, we're not just mailing them a certificate and saying, you know, good job. We, we really make sure that we provide meaningful 
political rewards to the politicians that take on our program and have success in it. And it costs money and it takes time. Um, and then within our program uh, and the certification itself, we're creating its incentives at different levels. So we're providing them incentives to get started and sort of quick rewards. And then we're providing them incentives along the way to um, encourage them to keep making progress. And we do that um, at the entry level. One thing we make sure to do is make sure that we've got um, there are standards, points they, they can score for things that many municipalities are already doing, kind of like the gateway drug, and then they can uh, get rewarded for it and feel like, oh, wow, this is great. We're, we're, we're getting recognized for something um, and it wasn't that hard. Um, and oftentimes they're getting recognized for things that were being done in different departments. And now they see this part of a unified whole, their sustainability initiative. Um, and then as soon as they get that first taste of success, there's the next thing waiting for them to do. Um, we also provide resources and that has a psychological impact as well as a, a, a sort of substantive impact. When um, someone comes to a mayor or to a business administrator and says, I wanna do this new cool thing, their first question is, how much does it cost? And um, the answer that we can provide and that we've teed up our advocates at the local level to provide is, uh, well, not only is it free, but it, it, by joining the program, you get access to new additional resources. And the reality is the, the dollars that we provide are pretty small in the context of municipal budgets, but psychologically, if you're a business administrator or a mayor, there's things that cost money and there's things that bring in money and you're just so much more likely to say yes to the things that bring in money. Um, and then finally, you know, wrapping this all together, I'm just gonna reiterate the state context really matters. Um, you know, the, the, all the things I've talked about, resources, making things technically safe and, pol and politically meaningful, um, all of that stuff really can only happen at the state level because it's in New Jersey uh, or you know, in general in the state where um, state, state government sets the policy context that defines what municipalities can and can't do. The resource providers are state agencies or regional foundations or other, other actors, um, the political rewards, tend to happen at the statewide level. You know, when, when people want to sort of crow and, and preen, um, they like the, the, the people that they consider their peers are other kind of statewide political actors. And so that's why when we think about kind of behavior change and what can we do um, to motivate municipalities to act at scale, um, kind of the big mantra and the big aha moment for our network and all these different state programs is you really have to start pulling statewide levers. And that is it.